Today we're going to talk about sharing our faith, or I'm going to provide us with one way that we can do that kind of an easy way. The fact of the matter is, we know the Bible says that we're supposed to share our faith with other people, but it's something that's kind of high up on the list of spiritual things we don't like to do. Confronting sin in our own lives, that's hard, but for many of us, the idea of sharing our faith is even more intimidating than facing down who we really are and what behaviors we need to change. But while we may look at sharing our faith as an intimidating exercise, we need to recognize it doesn't have to be. We've got to understand, there are some wrong ways to share our faith, but there is no one right way to do it. There's no one single right way to share our faith. We're all equipped a little bit differently. God has made some of us just natural people uh, people who are able to strike up an individual with anybody we come up next to and kind of naturally steer that conversation towards God. God has equipped many people to actually be like this, but most of us are not like that, including myself. Also, we've probably heard a lot of different methods of sharing our faith over the years. Some may involve drawing pictures or um, walking people through a certain set of steps or, or methodologies, and many of these are good approaches. Maybe they work for you, maybe they don't, and recognize just because they work well for someone else, God might have equipped you a little bit differently, so another approach might work for you. I'm going to walk you through one that I think has worked well for me, and I hope that it's a blessing for you. Lastly, I want to point out, too, a lot of the reason why we find this to be an intimidating exercise is for many of us, we think that sharing our faith has to be some sort of exercise in a debate of apologetics. Like we need to engage someone that we see at the grocery store in a theological debate and we must best them at every turn of the conversation or else we will fail in our endeavor somehow and not glorify God. If you are someone who enjoys apologetics and respectfully discussing apologetics with others, maybe this approach works for you. But for most of us, a different approach is probably appropriate. So, quick caveat, the methodology I'm going to share with you, I didn't come up with this on my own. I read it in a book uh, called Share Jesus Without Fear. I probably have a copy or two on my shelf. If you'd like to borrow it, let me know. I'll be happy to lend it to you. I've also made up a couple of quick cheat sheets that covers everything that we're going to talk about uh, in this discussion, and I'm happy to provide you with one of those as well. And just simplify the process and make things very easy on you. You don't have to take copious notes because I can give you the answers later. Just let me know if you want that. So here's our first set of five questions. And this is a very easy thing to do because all you have to do is remember the five questions. And the answer to each of these questions is going to be the same. And we're going to invoke what we call the hmm principle that the authors of that book had laid out. And that's don't answer the question with your own words. Whatever answer or response you receive to the question is, just simply respond with hmm and move on to the next one. You'll see how this works. The first question we want to ask is, do you have any spiritual beliefs? Notice how the question is worded here. We're not saying what spiritual beliefs are true. We're simply saying, do you have any spiritual beliefs? And inevitably, the person will say yes and respond with whatever those beliefs are. And here's why our hmm principle works, because we're not asking them what the correct spiritual beliefs are. We're simply prompting them to tell us what they believe. They're not going to be wrong in answering us what they truly believe because, well, that's what they believe. Do you have any spiritual beliefs? We're engaging them to open and open the conversation and start discussing with us. Now, don't misunderstand the hmm principle. I'm not saying disregard what they are saying. Not saying don't pay attention to what they are saying. Lovingly listen. We're trying to get where they're coming from. Just saying you don't need to engage them in the truth at this point. We're just trying to draw them into the conversation and learn a little bit more about them. Do you have any spiritual beliefs? Yes, I believe in Lorto, the god of fire. Yes, I believe in Allah. Yes, I believe in Buddha. You might receive many different answers here, but your response should be, hmm, and then move on to the next question. To you, who is Jesus Christ? This will inevitably elicit another response. And again, our hmm principle works because we're not asking who is Jesus Christ, we are saying to you who is Jesus Christ. There's no wrong answer because Jesus can mean many things to many people and people can be wrong. We're trying to get people to the point where they recognize they're wrong, but we don't hit them or confront them with that truth at this point. So we engage the hmm principle and it's not a judging hmm, it's just a hmm. 
showing we're listening, showing that we're engaged. Do you have any spiritual beliefs? To you, who is Jesus Christ? And then the third question is, do you believe in heaven or hell? And again, this is worded strategically, just like the second question. You're not asking, is there a heaven or hell? You're just asking them if they believe in it. And then you answer, hmm, and you move on to question number four, which starts to tie things up or bring things together. If you died, where would you go? Interesting. 90% of the time you're going to get an answer of, well, I'm a good person, reasonably good person, I'm going to go to heaven. Some people might say it'll be reincarnated. I have spoken to a few people in my life who have said confidently, I know I'm going to hell. To some people that didn't concern them, to others that I've spoken to, they it did concern them, but they thought that they deserved that and there was simply no way of avoiding it. This is a valid question. If you died, where would you go? And now... Instead of responding to whatever their answer with hmm is, we, we respond with question number five. And this is also strategically worded, so pay attention to this. If what you are believing is not true, would you want to know? If what you are believing is not true, would you want to know? This is very importantly worded because we're not saying... Those things that you told me, they're wrong, right? We're not being confrontational at this point. Remember, we're approaching this from a loving angle. We really want them to have what we have. We understand they've been blinded by the world. We need the Holy Spirit to open up their eyes and see the truth. We're trying to come alongside them and build a relationship. And what we're doing now is not telling them they're wrong. We are asking them for permission to share the truth with them. If what you are believing is not true, would you want to know? And if they say no, then disengage. Move on to the next person. Politely finish the conversation. Pray for that person. Maybe you get a chance to go through the process again. But if they say no, move on to the next person. They've already said they're not interested in hearing the truth. But if they say yes, and I'm telling you almost every time the way this question is worded, someone is going to answer it with yes, now we move on to the Bible. So as I mentioned here, we're going to look through seven different passages of Scripture and kind of like engaging the hmm principle with the first questions. When we work through these seven passages, we don't need to worry about all the words that we are going to say. We're not here uh, in this part to tell people what's in the Bible. We want the person we're speaking to to engage the Bible themselves. Right? So let's not read the verses to them. You should open up the Bible, find the passage, point to it, and ask them to read the passage. And the first passage we want to direct them to is Romans 3.23, which says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Open up the Bible, turn to Romans 3.23, ask them to read this passage, and then ask the person, what is this saying? Don't tell them what the passage says. Ask them to tell you what the passage says. And if they get it right, you move on to the next passage. If they get it wrong, don't spend time correcting them. Don't tell them what the Bible is really saying. Just ask them to go back and read it again and repeat the process. Do this as many times as necessary before until the person gets it right. And this is critically important. When I first started sitting down and sharing my faith with other people, I would walk down the Romans road with people and I would quickly uh, read a Bible passage like Romans 3.23 and then I would rush to tell them everything that it really means and, and explain to them what the scripture is really saying. And it was well-meaning, but the problem is whoever it was that I was working with would be engaging in my words and my explanation. So it was really about them and me having a discussion. We don't want that. We want to bring someone face to face with the word of God and let them grapple with that. Let the Holy Spirit work on their heart. Let them contend with God, not contend with us. So we want to direct them to the Bible and keep them in the Bible. Read, have them read Romans 3.23. Have them tell you what it means. And when they recognize that it says, all of us are sinners, we move on to the next passage, which is Romans 6.23. And what I do in my Bible is uh, I've just... Put those five, first five questions written somewhere in my Bible and then uh, uh, a reference of where that first passage is. And then right next to Romans 3.23, I'll have a, 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 a reference that shows what the next verse is to go to. And so you just flip through the Bible uh, and you can just follow along on this path and then have the last five follow-up questions written in there as well. Don't hide that. There's nothing wrong with having this methodology. If anybody questions it, you can say, yeah, I'm 
just wanting to make sure I get this right as we walk through this. As long as you approach this lovingly, it should be taken that way. So the second passage is Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Again, have your friend read the passage, have them tell you what it means. And if they get it right, move on to the next one. If they don't, have them repeat it. Next verse, John 3, 3. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Correct answer here is we must be born again. Move on to the next verse when the person is ready. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way. We have to get the person to recognize this and have them tell you that, not you instruct them. Once they're ready, we move on to the next verse, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 to 11, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. All right, now we're moving into the action part of this. The person has recognized they're a sinner. They've recognized they need a savior. They've recognized Jesus is the savior. Here's where they recognize what it is they must do to take advantage of the salvation. Next verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 15. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And the final verse is Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So we've just walked through with whoever it is we're sitting down with. They've encountered the word of God. They've learned that they're a sinner, that they're in need of a savior. They understand who that savior is, that they must be born again, that Jesus is the only way, that... They need to give their life for Christ. And that final verse is the invitation. God is ready for them. And if we let them work that out with God and with the Holy Spirit, chances are, if the person has worked with us this long, they're going to be ready to take the next step. And that leads us to our last five questions here. Number one, are you a sinner? Now, if a person has worked through these verses, there is no way they can answer anything but in the affirmative. Question number two, do you want forgiveness of sins? And if the answer to question number one is honestly yes, there is no way the answer to question number two could be no. Question number three, do you believe Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again? Question four, are you willing to surrender your life to Jesus Christ? And question number five, are you ready to invite Jesus into your life and into your heart? As you walk through these five questions, you got to understand whoever it is you're studying with would be grappling with the most important thing they have ever considered in their life. They may or may not be ready. You may get tears, you may get anger, you may get violence, you may get disbelief. You're going to see a range of different responses to what you're working with. And if the answer to any of these questions is no, don't press the issue. Lovingly talk to that person. Set yourself up to be there with them. Let them know that you want to follow up with them later on this, that you're going to pray for them. You're happy to study it further, whatever. Try to set up a, an appointment to be able to meet again to work through these things further. Somebody may not be ready to just change their life right away. Once you've walked through that second set of five questions, if the answer has been yes all along, then that person is ready to give their life to Christ. And once that happens, there's no reason to wait any longer. Simply ask them to pray along with you. And you, you can pray through it yourself and just ask them to kind of repeat what you're praying and just go through those seven verses. Dear God, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I recognize that I have earned death. I have fallen short of your glory and have earned death. I recognize also I know that your son, Jesus, is my savior. He, he, he went to the cross he died for my sins and on the third day that he rose again. I recognize that the only way to get to heaven and be forgiven for my sins is to be united with his death, burial, and resurrection. I make him my savior. I make you my God. I give my life to you. Please forgive me for my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. 
That's pretty simple. And of course, that's not the end of it. It's not easy believism that we're talking about here. It's not force someone to say these words. They're magically saved and you can move on. This is something that both parties involved need to be absolutely sincere in their conversation. And once that's done, you now have a responsibility with that person to help them begin their journey of serving God. This is not the end. This is just the beginning. And listen, things may not work perfectly walking through all five for the first set of questions, the seven verses, and then the next five questions. This is a guideline, but it's a pretty good one. I've used this successfully in the past, and like I said, it's wonderful because it's non-confrontational. When done right, it just feels very loving, and you're making it not about you at all. You're saying, what do you as a person, as an individual, believe? And you're pointing them to what God says and you're having them deal directly with God. You're taking yourself out of the equation, which is the right answer. Like I said, I've got a copy of this book if you want to borrow it. I've got some cheat sheets written up of this methodology if you want to try using this for yourself. Hope this has been helpful. Hope it's been interesting. And until next time, Lord willing, there is a next time. May God have mercy on you and your family.